it it was this sort of feeling of like okay our fate is sealed now like the the worst is happening like let's do this and like we all defend ourselves and we are like we're proud of who we are we're proud of what we've accomplished we're going to defend this as well we can hey there this is alpha bunga bunga the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history One of the most defining global struggles for the last few years has been the so-called Rojava Revolution, the attempt to carve out an autonomous region of Kurdish self-government in the north of Syria, all in the midst of the Syrian civil war, complete with new forms of inter-ethnic cooperation, gender equality, and participatory structures under the leadership of the Democratic Union Party, or PYD, and the YPG and YPJ, the People's Protection Units. Just as an aside, in the show notes, you'll find a glossary uh, because I appreciate that this alphabet soup of acronyms can be a little bit overwhelming. So after hopes for a democratic uprising against the Ba'athist regime in Damascus collapsed into a bloody sectarian civil war back in 2011, as well as cosmopolitan jihad, the Kurds offered the hope that a progressive multi-ethnic politics might be salvaged from the ashes of Syria's civil war and stand as a beacon in a region that is increasingly sectarian. Now, sadly, all of that's at risk. Turkey has launched an invasion into northern Syria with the express intention of destroying Kurdish control in the region. This is for two reasons. To kill off a Kurdish state, which might give Kurds in Turkey and the PKK hope, and in order to resettle Syrian refugees living in Turkey into northern Syria. This latter would have the added benefit, from Erdogan's point of view, of diluting Kurdish influence in that area. This is what is otherwise known as ethnic cleansing. Erdogan's incursion, with US assent, is de facto NATO allying with jihadists, once again, to crush the Kurds and to crush a radical experiment in the region. So sadly, what we might be witnessing now is the fall of Rojava. But we should ask that really as a question. Will Rojava's achievements survive the Turkish assault? What is Rojava about and what political ideals did it and does it embody? This week we're joined by two British volunteers who traveled from England to Syria to join and support the Kurdish struggle in Syria, one in a civilian, the other in a military capacity. I'm Alex Hochuli in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Phil Cunliffe is on the line in Canterbury. Uh, Phil, the news of the Turkish invasion a couple of weeks ago was pretty devastating. Yeah, dispiriting to all, I think. And I mean, not least also just because it's just yet another chapter in um, the bloody torment of Syria in the Syrian civil war. And also, of course, that it's targeted, um, it's specifically targeted a part of Syria that seemed to have that seemed to have uh, managed to establish some measure of um, some measure of hope for um, interethnic cooperation, I guess, and also for um, some vision of progressive politics and um, national liberation in the midst of a terrible civil war, like you said. Yeah, and, and not to turn it into a kind of good versus evil struggle, but I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the Rojava facing off against ISIS really was you know one of the, like an actually promising political f- form of organization against one of the most reactionary things you could possibly imagine uh, and now the turkish invasion seems to open the door once again to uh, to the jihadists to take control there so it's it is really dispiriting as you say yeah i mean well they're particularly it's a nato it's a nato um nato country one of the most powerful nato militaries allied with jihadist and Islamist militias to do their dirty work um, and to go on the rampage and um, against the Kurds. And I mean, a lot of this, a lot of this has already broken out on social media um, with particularly, I mean, some truly kind of shocking um, images and videos and so on. All of that adds to the misery and gloom of the situation. Yeah. And I think it's also probably worth exploring and taking this opportunity now to try to understand what the kind of shining light of Rojava actually was and what motivated so many volunteers to go over there. Um, Because it's something that we haven't seen for a long time, Western fighters 
going over to join a foreign struggle, but but who aren't jihadists well, because that's the yeah, exactly because... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've seen lots of it, but just um, a very different kind of struggle. Exactly. So um, so firstly, we're going to talk to Danny Ellis, who's an engineer by trade and a civil defense volunteer in Syria. She mainly works for the campaign Rise Up for Rojava. Here I am talking to Danny. All right. Hi, Danny. So first of all, uh, it'd be nice if you could tell us uh, what's going on, what's happening on the ground right there. Uh, as we were chatting last night before we were able to speak, actually, you told us that there was a Turkish advance and you were concerned about an attack. So what's the situation on the ground right where you are now? And maybe if you could also tell us a little bit more broadly how the Kurdish forces have coped with the Turkish attack. I wish I could give you a, a succinct answer. Um, the situation changes extremely quickly and and the changes are quite large each day that goes past. Um, so we're, we're still kind of processing what's going on. Um, at every stage really over the last couple of weeks, things have moved in sort of big swings every day from from like, you know, total peace and, and huge investment by the American military here to suddenly they're all gone. Um, right. To uh, to the SDF, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, of which the famous YPG and YPG are part of, uh, extremely well in in many areas to to losing uh, two um, critical cities. Um, to this uh, supposed ceasefire being being signed, uh, and the Americans actually selling us out even harder than we we were in the first place. Uh, and now this uh, sudden rapid involvement of Russia, um, which has you know, clearly been premeditated, very large numbers of, of Russian military police just have just suddenly turned up here uh, at a moment's notice, um, which, which usually the kind of thing that takes a few weeks of planning. So it, things are moving very quickly. Um, the Americans are now saying that they're going to send, send an, an armoured uh, tank uh armed vehicles and tanks to protect the oil fields which is just it's it's gone i would like to say it's gone from tragedy to fast but it's a mix of both at the moment wow right i mean i must imagine that is not only tactically very difficult to respond to but also psychologically taxing in terms of these Mm -hmm. these quite significant shifts from from day to day uh would you be able to tell us a little bit kind of where exactly your your base at the moment without obviously giving away any specifics or anything like that Tell us what it's like. Where sure, you are. I, I, I've been quite um, open on social media and on interviews about what I'm doing where I am in a hope that it kind of serves as some kind of education and also like uh, as a way of sort of humanizing the, the situation for people that are mostly seeing it through a lens of, of geopolitics and, and um, sort of nine o'clock news. And so I, I used to live in Derek, um, which is a city in the far northeast of northeast Syria. This is like at the the corner where Iraq, uh, Turkey, and Syria all joined together on the Tigris River. Um, I I was working there before as an engineer. I was travelling around quite a lot. And um, in the weeks before war broke out, I was uh, working in solar energy. Um, my background in electrical engineering, and I uh, I lived there for the last ten months, more or less. Um, it's it's a relatively peaceful and safe place, uh, but there has there have been attacks in the villages uh, since the war started. But about a week into the the war, um, I got an opportunity to travel to Tiltema, and Tiltema is much more central, and it's become a more or less a sort of base of humanitarian operations for the actions on the front lines. Uh, it's about ten kilometres away from one front line and thirty from another. Um, so I was doing I was doing civil defence works in. In Derek, and I was uh, doing interviews about these. I was making videos about these um, with Rock, who's a Catalan uh, volunteer who's who's with me. Um, and we decided to go where the help was more necessary. Until term, um, we've been making videos from there. Um, we've yeah, the work's been quite varied. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I want to actually delve deeper into a whole number of things that you just mentioned. It'd be nice maybe sure. just to start off if we could rewind a little bit. And if you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, 
uh, before we go into a little bit uh, the the kind of on the ground questions and some more political uh, angles on what's going on. So, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, you know where where you're from, what what motivated then you to to go to Syria? Sure. So I um, I don't really fit the mold for the sort of the the usual at least image of the kind of person that comes here to sort of fight ISIS and is typically reported on I I had quite a sort of liberal um upbringing in life uh, I have um I'm from London I'm 32 um I have an undergraduate degree in engineering uh, a master's in software engineering and um there has been about six and a half years at university in total and I had a really good, comfortable, well-paid job in London uh, working as a, as an electrical engineer um, in the broadcast industry mostly, so not really related to this. Um, and I sort of came to leftist politics in my mid-20s and it, it sort of slowly unfolded towards my, my the last part of my 20s and I became less and less uh, convinced that that the way we were operating as engineers was was a, a good moral sustainable thing and I'm like an immensely privileged person and I, I had a really privileged upbringing I have a very privileged education um throughout my life and I've never gone without I earn a lot of money uh, as an engineer and like I was disgusted with myself um, and 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 my place in society and um, seeing seeing how bad it was for a lot of people and how bad things were going to become so yeah that's like a the ideological side of of my journey and then the the kurdish side of it or at least the the, the syrian side of it was um seeing how the the politics here and not just the sort of the ideological stuff, which is very interesting, but also the, the practical side, like there are very pragmatic people and very pragmatic revolution here, uh, really, really inspired me. It wasn't really about dogma, it was about sort of actually just getting things done in, in the, the most democratic and, and um, the, the best way they could right. based so, on this philosophy. So, I mean, had you had any contact, for example, with the Kurdish community in London or had, did you any connection to Kurdistan in any way? I mean, or was it a, even an idea in your head or, or was it just the idea of, uh, of the Rojava revolution, which captured you? I mean, what was, what was the, the contact point? Yeah. So I, this is another point where I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm quite different to most people here in that, like, before I decided to come here, I'd had very, very little involvement, um, at all other than going to protest, um, and knowing some people who are involved with the community, like I, was basically not involved. I knew very little uh, about the specifics of this place. I had followed uh, with some interest the people who came here to fight and been very really saw myself as as one of those. Um, the 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 stereotype was like the sort of ex army um, guy without too much in the way of of political education coming here to to shoot um members of ISIS and I find it very interesting and and uh kind of a, a bit of fascinating but not something I really related to um but I I did end up reading quite a lot there's um there are some really good books that I wrote uh, that I wrote I read um on the subject um the one called Revolution in Rojava which is like a really good academic um tour of the place uh, I found really inspiring and then the the thing which really really triggered this this decision for me was in March last year and um, I came into work on one of the projects the, the projects I was working on and a friend said um he was really low and I asked him what the problem was and he was like oh this this person in our friendship group just just died from a, a Turkish airstrike in in Syria and like you know I didn't know her but I'm really torn up by it I was like oh is it the woman who's in the news and it was it was Anna Campbell um uh, who yeah. who went? She was a, a British woman, similar similar age to me, um, similar background, um, from a similar place, um, and uh, yeah, it turned out that that day and the next couple of days, I found out that a lot of my friends were very close to her. Um, I hadn't knowingly met her. We'd been in the same place a few times, but I'd never knowingly met her. But I started finding out these what she'd been doing, and um, and actually, like we were, we weren't all that different in in our backgrounds. But the difference was she was actually living and breathing her politics, and she was putting her life on the line for them. And I was still sort of 
at this point was was still living off the fruits of my labor so to speak and you know was living a very comfortable life and even though I'd quit my job by this point and I was working sort of full time as a volunteer like I I was still extremely comfortable and yeah it made me ask myself some really difficult questions about like what I wanted to achieve in my life um how how one is supposed to go about practicing your politics and and like sort of putting your money where your mouth is and yeah I decided within a few days that I was going to go um but it took me about nine months in the end to sort of make the arrangements um talk it over with friends family this sort of thing and and then finally go on a plane so you've been there for what about a year maybe a bit less than that is that right yeah, I came in December um, last year. Right, and what what is what is your actual work there? I mean, I'm sure uh, being an electrical engineer is in is in high demand in such a situation. So, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about what your kind of day to day, I sure. guess is. It's been quite varied, actually. I've um, so when I first actually like when I was standing in the airport and um, waiting to go, all of the screens flicked over to Erdogan is going to invade Syria, and so this December last year was another huge threat that that it was going to be invaded and I, I decided to get on the plane anyway um <laughs> for my sins and um uh, fortunately it turned out to be an enemy threat but because of this the the engineering well there's an ecological project called make Roger Java green again which i was expecting to join had um decided to sort of put things on on hold um and rather than being in, in the internationalist commune which is their sort of base of operations um had sort of spread people out amongst uh, families and various other places just to uh, reduce the chance of, you know, war, war being um, an issue. And I I ended up joining something called the Rojava Information Centre, um, which is like a, a collective that had literally just been formed of journalists and media people and various other volunteers um, who had formed to kind of fill a void in the region for English language um, sort of point of contact for journalists, reporting, you know, all unashamedly pro-revolution, but also trying to do it in such a way that, it's, that, that it is uh, as objective as possible um, as one can possibly be when reporting this kind of stuff. Um, so to, to give access to, to, to journalists and, and people that would, would otherwise struggle to um, uh, to get news about the area, not just news, but sort of facts and information. Um, and this was fascinating. Yeah, and, it's, it, and it's very useful. Me, it's a, at Rajava IC for, for listeners. Sorry to interrupt you. I just figured out. No, 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 that's great. No, yeah, thank you. They, they would have kicked me for, for getting this. Um, it, it was really fantastic, fascinating for me because I, I have quite a lot of experience with photography and geography and I had all my cameras with me and they need really used a photographer and, um, it meant that within a month of, of landing in Russia, I got sent to the front lines, um, which was not what I expected to do when I arrived. But it was like really uh, interesting baptism of fire to, yeah, I got a, you know quite a tour of the place and I came to like sort of really understand the struggle here in a really visceral way. Um, and like, you know, I certainly wasn't fighting and, and had a relatively easy time compared to most people. Um, it was, uh, it was, I was chucked in the deep end a bit and had to learn very quickly. Um, when you were sent to the front line that, you know, after a month there, who were you with? Were you, I mean, was it mainly Kurds? Was it uh, in other international volunteers? Where were they from if they were? So I was with one, um, I was with one other uh, French uh, volunteer who works for the, the Roger Information Center called Chloe. I, I say got sent to the front lines. I mean, I'm, I romanticise it a little bit. We asked to, <laughs> like, we, yeah, there were lots of people asking for information about it. Um, we had gone to see the SDF about another project. Um, their, their press guy had said, how come you haven't asked to go to Terrazor yet? Like all the other journalists are. And we're like, oh, we didn't realise it was an option. You know, we, we're not a normal press organisation. We don't have quite the same credentials or people haven't really heard of us. And he was like, no, it's no problem. We can arrange it for you. So, um, yeah, it was it was me and her. Um, and we were with the press pack for a lot of the time. We, um, because we're local volunteers who are part of the revolution and sort of not beholden to insurance companies, we got to go and actually stay with the YPJ. Um, one of the units of YPJ for, for a while, we got to go to 
some of the places, um, refugee camps where the ISIS uh, families were coming in there, a lot of the other journalists weren't getting access to, which was really fascinating. Um, and also, of course, like we, we're not part of the, the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, but because they, they saw us as part of the revolution and um, we, one of us spoke Kurdish and uh, we were, you know, we were supporting their cause. They, we also got access to information that, that journalists weren't getting quite the same way, which was, which was really useful and stuff that we could distribute as well. So it was a sort of meteoric uh, rise at this point we we got quite well known and um, we were being published in lots of different places and um yeah even though i left after this assignment and um, to go back to the commune um the the uh the Roger information has, has has like um has gone from like strength to strength uh, and and is now playing like a really vital role in the in the war situation So now you're back at, at the commune, right? And what are you, are you still uh, doing work for the Rojava Information Center or do you have other roles now? No, so I, um, I went, uh, so when you're a volunteer and you come to Rojava, you, you, there's usually a sort of mandatory period of what they call poede or education. And it depends where you go, what this is. So if you go and join the YPG or the YPJ, this is military education, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, but also education on language and culture and this kind of stuff. Um, I went to the Internationalist Commune, which is the sort of point of contact for uh, civilian volunteers. And so uh, I had a couple of weeks of uh, language education, a cultural education, um, a little tour of the country, uh, meeting various, going to various different projects. And it was it was quite an interesting period. And then after this went into... Um, Went to somewhere called Genealogy, which is the, the the women's movement here. It's the sort of base questions for a lot of the women's campaigning. Uh, it's it's a social science in its own right. It's also a a, a place of education, and and it's also an international movement. It's a it's a really interesting. Uh, I mean, you could do another whole podcast just on genealogy. I think um, it's a really fascinating take on a sort of decolonized social science. And um, so I then went and had sort of uh, extra education on on how the women's movement works, uh, on the history of it, on on quite how Kurdish feminism is is different to Western feminism. So that's fascinating. I wanted to exactly get on to to that to understand a little bit the degree of uh, political education that the volunteers receive, the volunteers might give. Uh, what, what what is the sort of degree of political education that's even going on? Uh, and maybe if you could tell us even, you know, is that happening within the YPJ and the YPG as well? Uh, and, and, you know, related to that, I guess, or, or consequent upon that, what kind, what's the content of that political education? What are the emphasis? And so, I mean, maybe to take the example you've just given to start there, mm-hmm. Um, if you could explain to our listeners what uh, what the content is of, of the kind of that Kurdish feminism that um, you're learning about there. So, that, so all of the different educations are quite varied across all the different groups. So, I mean, the, the sort of in joke is that the, the YPG get get the least of, of this, or at least they certainly seem to take on the least of this because it is um, you know, this male dominated military space. But like, certainly they still get a very thorough education in in the system here. So um, taking taking my experience as an example, um, it was a very, both of them were very intense periods of sort of nine to five-ish days for, for several weeks, um, which, um, you know, I, ha- I have been used to in, in both my degrees, but when you're also sort of living intensely close to people and, and cooking and, and cleaning and waking up to do exercise and stuff with these people. It's, it's a really physically demanding um, experience. Um, and the, the educations are, are really quite varied. Um, some of them are someone who has been campaigning within the Kurdish movement for a long time, coming and speaking about their experiences all day and you know, standing up in the front and just giving a, a lecture with a whiteboard. Um, some of them are exercises where you know we split out into groups and discuss a particular essay or uh, topic. You more, more or less kind of like a tutorial will be at university where you're discussing a um, an essay or something like this, um, or going like a, a crit in like uh, art students um, would have. You know where you you write something and and then criticize it in a group. There are there are practical 
maybe practical is the wrong word, there are sort of how to function educations of like, you know, this is how the movement works. Uh, this is this is how a tech mill and platform work, which I, I discussed in a minute. This is how, um, yeah, a language education, uh, this is how you should behave in families. This, this is uh, what general societal attitudes are towards various Western things and, you know, just preparing you for life in, in society. Uh, and then some of them are, are purely ideological. They're discussing the roots of, of democratic confederalism, um, which is like the current paradigm of uh, a number of different groups within the Kurdistan region in, in the Kurdistan Communities Union. Um, and also discussing how it came to be that democratic confederalism is is the paradigm, considering that there have there have been some quite social democratic uh, some social democratic groups um, and liberal groups within the Kurdish freedom movement, uh, for instance, like the the um, PDK and the PUK in um, Iraqi Kurdistan. There have been some really hardline Marxist-Leninist groups like the PKK, mostly operating in the Turkish region. Um, so it's it's a discussion of the history of these different groups and like how it is that there's like a, a thread of democratic confederalism now um, throughout all four parts of Kurdistan, but particularly in in Syria, and how like the uh, UID, which is the the Syrian uh, Kurdish party, has has come to adopt this um, quite so successfully. Yeah, so I mean, I, actually, on that, I mean, I was interested to know the degree to which you find amongst uh, amongst the volunteers there, uh, amongst you know, or, or even Kurds living there. I mean, the, the degree to which there is a general education in and belief in uh, the kind of socialist ideals uh, versus being basically Kurdish nationalists, uh, you know. I mean, <laughs> so I mean, that, I, they're not entirely disentanglable. Yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting question because for a lot of us um, who are, I would probably say most or all of us who are coming from, um, you know, particularly Europe, like nationalism is a really, really dirty word, right? It's something we associate with fascism. It's something we associate with our countries of imperial colonial past. And Kurdish nationalism is really quite a different strain, and it is quite hard to disentangle from the the socialist aspects and the the stateless and and um, radically democratic uh, parts of the movement. Um, it, it's 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 something that I kind of see as inevitable, given the history of the Kurds. It's something like I find myself quite often here during comparisons with um, the uh, the Irish struggle for for uh, independence yeah. and, or self determination, uh, particularly Northern Ireland. I think there's a lot of parallels, and you know, I, it's I think there's an, a, oppressed, an oppressed nation. And I think it's probably worth making that distinction. I, I mean, I I was in southeastern Turkey um, a couple of months ago, uh, and for some of the conversations that I had with with Kurds there, I mean, it was completely understandable that one would become a Kurdish nationalist. Uh, living yes. under living under that Turkish regime, so um, it, it's understandable. And I, I also wanted to ask, actually, whether there are um, many uh, Turkish-based Kurds who've uh, who've joined the forces there in Syria. If you've found that, so, yeah, certainly there's there's. Um, I mean, the majority of the Kurds here are Syrian Kurds, unsurprisingly. Um, but we've uh, we've for sure come across Kurds from um, all four parts, parts of Kurdistan. Um, there are a lot from Iran. Uh, there's a lot from um, from Iraq, Bashar, um, and and a lot from from Baku as well. Um, but it's also um, it's something that doesn't tend to come up very much unless you really are chatting to someone and delve into their their history because because of Kurdish nationalism in this sense, there there is a drive to simply define as Kurd. And and not as someone you know who has come from Turkey, the Kurdish part of Turkey, or or uh, you know, the Iraqi part of the, the Kurdish part of Iraq. Um, so yeah, that that in itself is an interesting point of discussion um, of how how people are identifying. Um, you know, I I, I think the I think that the, the sort of nationalist elements of this movement are um, are decolonial in at their core i think that's the the real key difference between the nationalism that that those of us come from europe are are used to um and it's also not exclusive um they are 
we are also here fighting for some kind of Kurdish nation. But there is a really strong drive and something that's at the core of all of the education and all the teachings and all of the, the organization here that, uh, that, that involves recognizing that whilst we need to drive towards decolonizing our nation fr from the, of removing the colonizer from our nation, we also need to make sure it's not repeated on others and making sure that there is um, minority representation in anything we do um, for, for both race and gender. So I actually wanted to move on to some of the political and, and strategic uh, elements in the kind of last couple of minutes here. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I mean, while you were there, um, you obviously had the announcement of the, of the U.S.'s withdrawal. What was the reaction to that? I mean, I'm sure it was dismay primarily, but did you find that it was a surprise amongst uh, some of the people around you, uh, maybe some of the more senior authorities around you? Yeah, the 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 atmosphere, particularly in the few nights after the the few days and nights after the the announcement, was quite it was quite difficult to 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 sum up. And um, on the one hand, like people were furious and really felt like they'd been betrayed. Um, but at the same time, like the the first couple of pro like there was a protest on the night and. Um, in Derek, my hometown, that the attack started. Uh, and it was like one of the most joy, joyful or jubilant, I suppose, uh, protests I'd ever been to. Like, it it was this sort of feeling of like, okay, our fate is sealed now. Like, the, the worst is happening. Like, let's do this. And like, we will defend ourselves. And we are, like, we're proud of who we are. We're proud of what we've accomplished. We're going to defend this as well we can. And um, it was, defined, it was really... images uh, that I think were... Um, spread across the media from from some of those protests yeah they were quite uh, and all over as well like in all the major cities there were these kind of protests and um, it was it was really powerful stuff it was really moving and you know i had my myself like try to resist the urge to sort of go and pick up someone's gun and run to the front lines it was really like inspiring stuff and um, at the same time you know there were that there was this awareness that they were facing off against sort of the ultimate uh, enemy this huge huge army um that has a lot of international support uh, you know nato um, and and the yeah the the feeling the feeling of immense betrayal like you know it couldn't have been much worse it wasn't just that the americans had pulled out in the preceding weeks the the uh syrian, syrian democratic forces had signed up for a, um a security arrangement and um, which was mediated by the United States with Turkey, whereby they had agreed reluctantly to just destroy their fortifications along the border with Turkey, had agreed to give up um, or withdraw all of their heavy weapons and guided missiles, this kind of thing, from the border. Um, uh, and had done this. Uh, the Americans supervised them doing this. They'd published protests and doing these things. And in return, the Americans had, had guaranteed their... The, integrity of the border and and would not be allowing they, they were patrolling the border on on behalf of turkey and wouldn't allow incursions the week that this was finished that these um this withdrawal and this destruction of, of fortifications was over uh was uh the week that trump decided to, to pull the troops out so it was at the point not just that they were weak but the point at their weakest that Trump decided to, to step into that. And people really do see it as Trump, I think, even though a lot of anger was taken out on the American soldiers withdrawing and a lot of people, you know, ask if I'm American when they see me and, and I have to really calm them down and say I'm not. Like, I do think that most people really see this as, as something that Trump has done to them um, and are seeing, seeing as being betrayed by by the West yet again. I mean, well, as you say, it's, it's hardly the US's first betrayal of the Kurds. So, I mean, with that in mind, and I appreciate this might be a bit sensitive, but I mean, do you think it was it was wise for for uh, the Kurdish forces, for the SDF to vest their hopes in U.S. air support? Uh, was the assumption that, you know, if there w were to be a withdrawal, it would be less sudden, it would be less um, based on opening the door for Turkish forces to invade? Yeah, I, I've seen this uh, among some of the left of, of this a feeling of sort of if you actually it's not just amongst the left it's also a lot of, a lot of the pro-Turkish commentators 
saying about um, you know, how can you call this a, a democratic revolution or a stateless revolution or or any kind of anarchism or anything when you know you're relying on a, on the world's largest imperial power to sort of protect you. I, I think I think we need to understand that they didn't have much of a choice. Um, the the coalition provided really critical support uh, at a time where the Kurds had just about started to turn the tide against ISIS, but were really in a particularly bad situation. Um, and they were fighting an adversary in, in ISIS that ha had been born out of a power vacuum that had been created by the imperial powers like the US and the UK uh, in their uh, disastrous invasion of, of uh, Iraq back in 2003. So there was this uh, reluctance to accept, acceptance of help um, and uh, a feeling of, uh, I guess, I, 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 mean, I can't call it gratitude, but a feeling, a feeling that at least the, the coalition, uh, the international coalition, were, were trying to clean up some of the mess in some way. Um, and of course, this only finished in March this year. And the situation with ISIS was still quite bad. There's a lot of sleeper cells in, in the southern regions. And and there wasn't really much of a choice. There's no way that the Kurds could have simply asked the Americans to leave. The Americans have invested a lot here. And they see this, they had seen this place as a way of controlling Iran's influence in, in the region. Um, and they had tried very hard, the, the Syrian Democratic Council, to negotiate with the Assad regime. Because they, they, this has never been a purely separatist movement. They've always... Um, been pro uh, the integrity of the Syrian nation as a as a set of borders at least, um, and and they were blocked from negotiating with the Syrian regime by the Americans. In this situation, a country of sort of three or four million people with uh, a, an army that's primarily comprised of light infantry can't really do anything about the world's great superpower sitting on their lawn. Uh, and had to make the best of the situation. And to be honest, like they really have made the best of the situation. They've there was a quote by the American ambassador or the American special envoy, I think, to Syria, uh, um, not too long ago. Well, one of the generals, I can't remember, one of the American administrators, who said they, they've they've probably played the weakest hand I've ever seen, the best I've ever seen. Um, unfortunately, for all the ideology you can have, you still have to occasionally play the game of geopolitics and and they they have tried to do that. Um, just finally, I wanted to ask what kind of actions could people in Western countries take right now to, to offer support to, to the Kurds in northern Syria? I, I wrote about this just at the beginning of the workshop because quite a few people asked me. And um, the main advice I, I've been giving to my friends is, is about spreading the message, but not in just sort of sharing Facebook, sharing um stuff on Twitter but like actually like going to the people who are not engaged with the subject and, and just explaining to them the situation here um going to friends and family going to colleagues and sit and like you know over coffee or something or whilst you're at work on a break just sort of actually explaining in clear terms what this place was what it represented for humanity and sort of what has been done to it um and how because I think any I think any rational, sympathetic person will be livid. Like they'll be really, really bloody angry where when you see that there was this feminist democratic system that had managed to, to be built up in the midst of one of the most brutal wars of of this century. Um this revolution managed to exist in a very difficult place. It gave uh, not just rights, but power to women. Or I should say women in this area took their power. Um, that there was great respect for, for diversity. There was, there was great respect for living in harmony. There was great respect for ecology and nature here. And that this is right now being snuffed out by uh, a, a NATO, a strategic ally, a NATO ally of, of the West using former elements of groups like al Nusra Front, like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, in a really brutal and unprovoked way, um, and is committing ethnic cleansing on, a, on an enormous scale. Already just after two weeks, 300,000 people have lost their homes. 
um and it's it's being openly backed by the united states uh, and when i say openly i mean like twitter has gone on television saying you know it's great the kurds have been moved out of their homes they can go and live in the desert yeah. Yeah. like almost verbatim like and when you describe this to people like what this was what it represented for humanity like that this was this was a real hope for humanity not just for the region but for the whole for the whole planet this was the kind of system change that a lot of climate change pro uh, protesters are uh, are talking about or certainly should be talking about uh, and and now it's uh we're, we're seeing images of civilians who decided to stay behind in these regions being executed in the street um we're seeing uh uh still struggling soldiers having their heads cut off we're seeing uh uh women's bodies uh, these ypj fighters being mutilated by these people live streamed on social media whilst we wearing turkish uniforms and carrying turkish guns uh, and and our government won't do anything about it because they want to maintain they want to maintain control of the Bosphorus. They want to continue selling weapons um, through British Aerospace, through Rolls Royce. Uh, you, you name a defence company, they probably have an interest in Turkey. Danny, thank you so much for joining us and uh, wishing you and, and your comrades there uh, all the strength and courage and, and do keep safe. Great, thank you very much, and thank you for having me on. All right, great to talk to Danny there. She's at Lapinesque on Twitter. That's L-A-P-I-N-E-S-Q-U-E. -E. You should also follow the Rajava Information Center. That's at Rajava I-C. Now, Phil and I are going to ring up Alexander Norton, who's now back in the UK, but was a military volunteer in Syria for two years with the International Freedom Battalion. Start with uh, we should start with northern northern Syria with Rojava. Uh, you were there from 2015 to 2017, so maybe That's, I think yeah. b before you tell us about your time there, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how your political views were formed before joining the Kurdish struggle, and then what was the the moment which led you to decide that uh, the Kurdish struggle was something that was interesting that was going on, and that actually you wanted to practically contribute on the ground there. Oh. Yeah, so my political background is relatively typical for someone who joined the left as a young person in the UK. I'm a Londoner and I was on that huge demonstration in 2003, which was like a million people, two million people, depending who you ask, against the war. I genuinely thought there wasn't going to be a war because there were so many people on the streets and because it was just such an insane fucking thing to happen. Um, you know, they just, I just thought there cannot possibly be a war against Iraq. Iraq's done nothing. It's got nothing to do with terrorism. And there was. And I became radicalised, I suppose, uh, by that. Though I don't consider myself a radical, I consider myself, you know, socialist, communist. And um, then I guess the first big thing that happened to me was I went to Palestine as soon as I finished school when I was 18 because someone from my school, from my sixth form college rather, um, had been shot by the IDF whilst doing humanitarian work um, whilst I was still at school. And I went to his funeral to represent the school and spoke to people and I decided that I'd do what he did. I went out to Palestine myself. And, you know, got shot at by the IDF, tear gas beat and all that stuff, which um, probably didn't help in terms of uh, <laughs> de-radicalising me, I suppose. Uh, when, uh, if any cops are listening to this and kind of plotting, <laughs> plotting my descent into, yeah, into being a person of interest, that's probably a large factor. Um, what, do you, do you, what do you think, wait, but, uh, uh, Alex, do we have an audience that's cops? Oh, well, definitely, <laughs> definitely, <all> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, maybe exactly. maybe that's a, a market we should try to break into. I hadn't really considered it. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could have like copo centric topics. I'm not sure, not sure quite what. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Alexander. So uh, yeah, please carry on. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, so I came back from Palestine, and yeah, then then my life was a bit more normal. But I always remained on the kind of more radical left because of my experiences. Um, I always considered myself a socialist until a very brief period where I was, I was a libertarian, identified very briefly. But I think the main thing is that I took most of the general uh, libertarianish, Trotskyish kind of uh, ideas for granted. They were just part of the air that we breathed, you know, whether we were being trade union activists from the left, whether we were being whatever, anti-war activists from the left. There's just assumptions. And I think what really changed for me was um, in 2011, I was cheering on the um, so-called Libyan revolution. I even occupied Saif Gaddafi's uh, house in 
Millionaire's Row, which was mostly motivated by the fact it was on Millionaire's Row rather than, um, you know, because just as, as a sort of class war stunt, really. Um, but I remember someone sort of pulling me aside and just being like, this is imperialism. This is a stitch up. This is not what you, you think. You know, you, you're backing something that's very dark and very bad and you'll see how it works out. And indeed I did. And I, I came to question most of the assumptions about, you know, the kind of ultra leftish assumptions that we have in the West. And I realized that my positions, the positions of all of us really, but far, far the minority in the global scene. And, uh, and from that point on, I, I guess I joined the majority of communists in the world. Uh, in fact, the majority socialist position, if you discount social democracy and then uh, became a Marxist Leninist, um, which was a very, very strange thing to do for most of the people around me <laughs> in 2012. Um, I was looking around the world, took a lot of inspiration from struggles in India, Nepal, uh, the Philippines, of course, um, as well as historical ones. I'd travelled to Cuba years ago on a, just on a holiday and couldn't see anything wrong with it. And um, one of the things which really, really blew me away was the revolutionary organisations in Turkey and how they maintained both underground organisations which could resist the strongest attacks from the state and, and strike back. Uh, they could run their areas in parallel to the state in certain parts of Istanbul and other places, also in rural areas. And they could also have overground organisations, some of the best leftist newspapers and, in fact, like even TV stations, if you're counting the Kurdish movement. And that really impressed me. So I was watching Turkey. And um, then there was the um, uh, Gezi Park uprising. And that's really where I become really interested because the Gezi Park uprising, for me, there was a huge potential, you know, because this was going to be potentially a revolution in a very developed country and very close to us as well. You know, it has a very strong relationship with Greece. People go and come and go from Turkey to Greece all the time and leftists do visit Turkey. It's not like, say, like, for instance, like I mentioned before, it's not like Nepal. You know, Turkey is, is our neighbour. It's very much part of the European history and, and, and daily life. You know, the migrant population of Germany, the primary migrant group is Turkish people. Um, which I didn't find out till actually in Syria when, when the German person told me. Um, so I was very excited by the Gezi Park uprising. Um, didn't have any way of getting involved, of course. And then when I found out about the Rashava revolution, I was like, ah, oh, if this is successful, if this inspires an uprising of Kurds and leftist groups that support the Kurds, which is really what I was interested in, or rather what I was reading, then this will lead to sort of Gezi too. And we'll have a revolution in Turkey. And who knows where else? And so that's where I, where I became excited about Rashava. I didn't go to Rashava or didn't make plans to go um, until a bit later um, from first hearing about it because the groups available were the Lions of Rashava. And I had a friend, actually, uh, a good old friend who was talking to them and quite serious about going, but he dropped out. And so that never came to fruition, though. It was when Ivan Hoffman, who was uh, um, a mixed race, um, black woman from Germany. Her mum is white German. Her dad was from Togo. And she had learned Turkish and joined a Turkish communist group called the MLKP and travelled to Syria and died fighting against ISIS. And it was an amazing, amazing story. And I actually very quickly managed to find some friends of hers in Germany and speak to them. And I was completely blown away by this. And I just, I'm essentially a propagandist. If there's anything that I do to any degree well on the left it's uh it's spotting good stories and the ways of drawing things out and i thought ivana hoffman's story was just i mean i'm not saying it in an exploitative way like i was moved by it and i just thought if people need to be moved by this if we're not moved by this if we don't volunteer because of her you know what will we actually be moved by you know we, we must be dead inside the left's not worth its its name if it doesn't get inspired by this and so in 2015 I went out um, as a civilian volunteer first because, <laughs> well, because my family asked me to be a civilian first, but also there was a, um, there was a fence there as well, which is, you know, if you go out and find out it's all actually just terrible, like nationalist gangster regime, um, at least you haven't killed anyone. <laughs> so I, so I built a hospital. So could you tell us a bit when you arrived there, um, kind of how are the, uh, you know, what happens when you arrived on the ground? How are the volunteers received? And, What's the process of um, how they decide what work you'll be doing and this kind of thing? Yeah. So these were two different projects. So in 2015, I was part of something called the Reconstruction Brigades, something similar to that, um, organised by an alliance of communist parties, revolutionary communist parties from across the world. 
generally relatively small parties, apart from the Turkish party, which is the MLKP, which is quite big um, for Turkey. And uh, yeah, that was a workers' brigade. Um, not everyone was had a background in construction, but a, a surprising number did, because I had a really strong base in a, in a German party called the MLPD, who encouraged their youth to uh, get a trade <laughs> rather than go to university. Uh, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. I, was, I found that found that really kind of amusing, but also impressive. And um, yeah, so we got there, and there was a completely self-organised project with the Kobani Revolutionary Administration to build, uh, to do reconstruction work and build this fortified hospital, which would double as a bomb shelter. And they did that in batches of six. So you'd have a month brigade uh, for six months rolling, and it happened immediately after the end of the siege of Kobani, when um, ISIS were driven out of Kobani at last. Um, but it overlapped with the ISIS revenge attack, which happened about a month after the end of the siege of Kobani, or maybe a couple of months, where they activated all their sleeper cells and came in uh, from further away and killed about 200 people. And the volunteer reconstruction workers were still there in the town and were hidden by um, people in, in, in the city, who obviously risking their lives to hide them. Um, so, they, so it was not safe at all. And the way in at that time was through the border of Turkey and that was, and now it, you can do that. You can't cross that border. It's just a war zone, but it was, it was already pretty bad. Like it's, it was more, it was much scarier than the fence, which I'd seen to, the separation wall that I'd seen in Israel as a, as a kid, as an 18 year old, like this thing was heavily militarized. And as we were crossing it, I was buddied up with, um, you know, take care of one, one other person. The person I was taking care of was a 70 year old builder from Germany. And um, I was helping him across and we just got to these rolls and rolls of razor wire. And um, one of our guides just like threw down a plank. And I just remember thinking there's absolutely no way we're going across that. No, not a chance. But somehow we managed to get across the other side because behind us an APC was like zooming up. And if I remember correctly, it fired in the air. And then there was some other fire back from um, the Syrian side to let them know that both sides were armed. And, um, and yeah, and they just ran off into the into the dark until we were picked up and you know warmly greeted by the people even though it was the middle of the night people came out of their houses and, and put onto different backs of lorries and, and driven all the way to Kobani and then the next day was just the start of a very very hard slog um doing construction work in insanely hot weather um all of the so Germans were you were in on. were you in were you actually in Kobani then when the ISIS um counter-attack the revenge attack happened no, I wasn't. It was the brigade before. Um, and so some of the people had stories from that. Um, but it was very much a, like we had armed uh, volunteers with us all the time. They weren't from the YPG. They were from um, the HPG, I think it is. I can't remember now. Something I saw all the time. Who just, just like one person per street gets given a vest and an AK and it's like the local police person, which, of course, was really important during during the Civil War. I mean, it would be important right now as well because the civil war continues and they take care of their immediate community. So we had one of those and that could be like, a, you know, a woman in her 50s. It could be a guy. It could be anyone. Um, but we we definitely felt that we needed to have that there all the time because ISIS were very much a, a more present then in 2015 than actually when I was um, when I was armed myself later on because ISIS were much more in the back foot. At that time, ISIS were extremely confident. And their presence was kind of felt everywhere. I went into a tool shed and it had clearly been an, an ISIS uh, to, to grab some tools for work in Kobani. And it clearly been a shed, sorry, it clearly been an outpost for ISIS. There was all this graffiti on the wall, some of it in Cyrillic, some of it in languages I didn't recognise. Uh, but also from um, from England as well, there was one saying that was it like Generation Khilafa, something, something, brigade of whatever. And I can't remember, but I, I just, I could really imagine who the guys were and, you know, what their lives were like and probably where they came from somewhere in Birmingham. And I just, it felt otherworldly really to bump into like British graffiti from the other yeah. side. Yeah. Like, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, cause you get so many different, you know, the, the foreign interpenetration to Syria throughout the civil war, of course, like with all the kind of great powers and smaller powers allied to it throughout the period since 2011. But then at, at, an, at another level, you also get, you know, foreign volunteers coming in and then from all sorts of places, um, many yeah. also from, from where their own states aren't even parties to the conflict. So I guess you, you do get this kind of <laughs> weirdly cosmopolitan feel uh, to, to certain yeah. things there, as you say, with like graffiti yeah. from all over the place. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd be interested to know, I mean, at least for on, not on the, the ISIS side, but, uh, but, but on, the, on the Kurdish side, 
what and and on kind of the allied organizations supporting the Kurdish struggle, what kind of political views you encountered there? Because like with any sort of foreign struggle, you're going to get people coming from not only different backgrounds in different countries, but also with different political motivations to join. Uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about that and also like how that relates to uh, the battalion that you were part of, the International Freedom Battalion. Sure. So so let's skip forward a, a about six months then, because that was the construction project and that was great. But I came home in between um, having kind of convinced my family and my partner that Oh, he's done it once. He'll be safe again the next time. When in fact, I was going to fight the next time, which I didn't tell them. Though I think I, I told my partner I was, but I didn't tell my parents and my family. Um, so I returned to fight and I was going to be in a unit called the International Freedom Battalion, which was uh, part of the YPG. So a unit in the YPG, the Kurdish led YPG. The IFP was set up in 2015 by an alliance of communist parties and at the time, one anarchist group from Greece. Um, the communist parties are from. Turkey, with the exception of one which was from Spain. This is the original foundational groups. The makeup's changed a little bit now. Um, though the makeup today of the IFB is, again, it's eight parties and seven of them are from, sorry, it's eight groups. Seven of them are communist parties from Turkey, which includes the MLKP, TKPML, which has been fighting a guerrilla struggle in Turkey for 47 years, um, and various smaller Marxist Leninist groups. And then there's one group in it now, which is Tekashin Anarchist, which is um, Anarchist Struggle, which is a group which is actually formed, um, as I understand it, there specifically for anarchist volunteers to volunteer in the IFB, in the YPG in Syria. So it's, it's not a group that exists outside of that, as far as I understand. So it's seven Marxist Leninist or Maoist parties, one anarchist group currently. And, and, and I've, it's got, I've up- got to jump in and, and apologize to our listeners for the alphabet soup that we're inevitably going to get. This is yeah. obviously your fault, Alexander. Yeah. It's just an inevitability <laughs> of discussing this. I, I, actually, uh, I'm going to put in the show notes a little kind of primer just in case uh, those who aren't familiar sure. with the Syrian conflict to check, you know, and yeah. to make sure you know your YPG from your YPJ <laughs> and your PYG. Sure. And you know, could you, could you but just to add to that, could you give us a, could you give us a sense of, um, so I mean, in addition to the kind of political groups like um yeah. you know the demographics uh middle class working class age um yeah. kind of ethnic background maybe those kind of details as well i think just to make things a bit more concrete because it's um i think it's it's good to build up a picture because it's absolutely fascinating yeah. everything you're saying so the majority of the ifb were turkish and i mean like the overwhelming majority so when we were at um uh when we were at say 30 people only like you know, five or six would generally be internationalists who weren't Turkish. In terms of the makeup of the Turkish people, um, the majority of them were Alevi. If uh, if you know what that means, Alevism is a is a culture and a religion in the whole region, but especially in Turkey, which has it's it's a form of Islam. But I think as it's been explained to me, it was something that came before Islam, has adopted Islam to survive, but has lots of things which aren't really traditionally associated with Islam at all, like dancing until you're really dizzy, whirling dervishes. Did you know, is this ringing a bell? Yeah. And um, <laughs> playing music. And, right, good. And uh, and playing music. So the similar religion is actually the guitar, the saz, as I understand it. I'm going to get get shit from people that know a lot more about this than me. So, uh, yeah, basically every time I said, every time I found out about Alevism, I would just randomly look, oh, yeah, yeah, you're a Levy. And everyone would be like, yep, yep. Alevism, um, as I understand it, really pushes forward women's education in a way which is not typical of the region or maybe not typical of Turkey or, and there are a lot of women. I mean, there was, uh, it feels like roughly half women. Women were expected to take command positions on the basis of them being women, you know, as in like, it's not, it's not a choice. The fact that you're a woman is, means that you will probably take a command position, like a, like a team commander or a higher commander, a team is of 10 people. And then above that would be, you know, the battalion commander, which would be of all, I feel like 30 or 40 of us. Um, though that was, that's when we were at fighting unit. The groups which sent people to fight in the IFB had their bases, these different political parties all over um, Rashava, mostly in one town, which is um, which just fallen into Turkey, actually, um, called Serikani. Um, so 
when they weren't fighting at the front and we weren't necessarily always fighting at the front, but we were holding a position. And this is something I say to people who want to talk about, you know, war stories, you know, what did you do? What didn't you do? Yeah, I was just about to ask you that actually. <laughs> yeah. My, my position that was, I'm not a soldier. I'm a revolutionary. And that's something very different because we got an article written about us in the sun where someone disparaged us for having no military training. And I was like, I'm a revolutionary communist. The whole point is that I've come from, you know, the railway tracks to fight in a, in a revolution, in, a, in an armed revolutionary civil war. That's the point. I don't have any military background. That's the point of what a revolution does. It's meant to transform the people involved so that the people on your block, you know, the people in your workplace take up arms and fight and become revolutionaries in an armed sense. So I was very happy to have no military background. That, that was the point. I was, I was a leftist who finally entered the highest stage of, of the struggle, which it, to me is, as a Marxist feminist is the arms struggle. And um, yeah, so when you weren't actually fighting, you're still holding a position. So everyone in the YPG is doing that. They're holding a line. So you never really knew. Like I had a mad, amazing knack not to be attacked. Like every time I left the base to go to a different point, maybe to do some different stuff like propaganda work or community work or working in the political side of things out, out, out of my uniform, then like the base would get attacked. <laughs> so I spent like three weeks at a particular base. And then move on. And then like two nights after, I'd find out that they'd just been attacked by like an ISIS guerrilla unit. And I had, had this amazing fight and fought them off and everyone was fine. And, and you know, and I just, this happened to me, like, even one time when I was really, really sure that I was going to go fight. And I was like driven, because I, I was in the first advance group towards this village outside Raqqa. And we got there and there was no ISIS and we secured it. We set up our position and they'd done something like they, they doubled back and they attacked the unit behind us who were really pissed off because they wanted to fight. <laughs> and they were the ones that got attacked um and uh yeah so i had had a knack not to get attacked but the point is they can't they could have attacked anywhere if you're holding position you're taking your part in the war you know and yeah there were times when i fired my weapon and other things but it's really not the one it's not the thing I, i like to talk about i like to talk about the transformation from anyone becoming anyone going from what they are to become a revolutionary to carry a weapon and to take that risk you know death was always there we were given two grenades one was like a room clearance grenade the other was a fragmentary grenade, but we weren't encouraged to use it. We were encouraged to keep it on us to stop us from being kidnapped, to be captured by ISIS. They were like, don't let yourself be captured. Either shoot yourself or just pull the pins on your grenades. And that's that's what the grenades were really, um, really seen as. So I mean, that was something we knew from the start. I wanted to... Um... To talk a bit, I mean, I'm glad you've kind of set it up like that because I did want to talk a bit about the um, the political aspects of it. So you've talked about the various political groups that formed that helped form the um, the IFB, but obviously, I mean, uh, when people think of um, Rojava and everything about it, the biggest um, you know the biggest associations are with with anarchism. Um, mm-hmm. It's been and obviously with um, the fact that that it was famously inspired by Murray Bookchin, the American anarchist and the LSE yeah. professor um, David Graeber, who's um, also an anarchist. He's made a, you know, he's done a lot of kind of um, propaganda yeah. defending Rajava's anarchism, and then obviously the ideas of democratic confederalism. So I wondered if you could um, I talk yeah. a bit about how how the IFB related to that politics and how it worked out on a day to day basis yeah. when you were interacting with the PYD and with Kurds on the ground and so on. Definitely, definitely. So I had a chance to be part of the political revolution as well as the armed revolution. So most people in the IFB in these revolutionary parties would spend their time at the front in the unit or they'd be back in their bases and they're doing theoretical training or practical training. Um, I was assigned closer to the Turkish group, the MLKP, which within the time of the Rashad revolution, um, it actually expanded its name from being the Communist Party, Marxist Leninist Communist Party of Turkey and Kurdistan, which was an ideal, uh, um, which was a political step for them to say we're now organising the whole of Kurdistan, not just the um, part which falls into Turkey, but the whole of Kurdistan, inclu- including Rojava and the other parts as well. So including Syria and I, I guess assume Iran, and um, that meant that they were organising politically, and so by working with them. I had a chance to join um, a branch of Tevdem, the Democratic Society Movement, which is what people have heard of when they when they learn about the political system in Rojava. They've heard of democratic confederalism and the system Tevdem. 
I was part of what's known as like an office of Tevden. And it was our job to create communes, um, alliances between different ethnic or cultural groups. So I would go to different places, basically as kind of decoration a lot of the time. They'd be like, look, this guy's from London to come and support the democratic and federalist system. Isn't that great? And, you know, and the, the, like the Liberal Party of Kamishlo or the uh, Assyriac Association of Kobani would be like, oh, cool, that's great. Yeah, have a cup of tea. And I'm like, oh, thanks so did, so um, did it work? Did it work? Were they happy to see yeah, Westerners yeah. on the ground? Yeah. Very much so, very much so. And um, and then we talk about the system. We talk about how everyone's going to have a voice, how no one's going to be subjected to tyranny of the majority so that if there's five Syriacs, they're still going to have one representative. Even if there's like a thousand Sunnis, they're going to have one representative. And no one's going to be um, bullied by tribal or religious sectarianism. And they should commit to this power sharing system. And they agreed to. And then we'd have a really big meeting but the different representatives of these different communities would stand up and commit themselves to Democrats, the, to the Rashad revolution. Democratic and federalism isn't a term that I remember using very much, actually. Um, I think we just, I think we used more specific terms around that time. Um, I can't, nothing springs to mind, but I think, so that was the system that I saw. That's what I saw in place. I also saw some incredible things like, such as the houses of women, the Malagel, which are women-only places where women can go and talk about their problems, which relate only to women. Um, they banned polygamy. Um, they banned child marriages. Um, they started to legalise abortion. When I say they started to, I think it was no longer a crime, but it was quite hard to get an abortion. Um, all these amazing steps forward for women. And there was even a women's police force that dealt specifically with, with women's problems. So obviously primarily sort of things like domestic violence or being pressured into marriages. So there's a women's police force of just women for women to go to. And these were some of the amazing things that I saw and experienced. And another one was, was um, as Marxist, we were always talking about, you know, organising the workers, where are the trade unions? And eventually they were like, oh yeah, cool, let's go and visit the trade unions. And we met this amazing woman. In fact, there was two women, but one of them was, was more in the leadership position. And she talked about how they're going to start a revolutionary trade union and in the process of speaking to the workers, we went out with her to some very small factories, which are kind of more like more like garages, really, like fixing cars, building cars from scratch in very, very small garages. But um, they, those are the closest things, really, to factories that we saw that, that were really there. And, uh, and they spoke to the workers there and talked about how we were going to be part of, like, one big union um, for the revolution. And what else on top of that? Um, well, let me, I'm just going mean, to jump in, actually, because I wanted to ask, you know, the, the appeal of Rojava in part is based on some of these things that you're describing. So the fact that uh, it doesn't rely on sort of et ethnic nationalism, uh, that, you know, the, the role of feminism or gender equality is quite important. Uh, and as, you know, as a sort of national liberation struggle, those are quite appealing things, especially because there's many national liberation struggles which you may support, but which have uh, a far worse record on, on this count, for yes. example, right? So yeah. I guess that's, that's a big part of the appeal. But there's another element to it. There's another layer, uh, which uh, I guess Phil was referring to in his question a little bit, about that it, it, it being seen as a democratic or anarchistic sort of utopian yeah. experiment. And I guess I, yeah. I'm interested to know where exactly you would draw the line there. Do you see it as primary uh, national liberation struggle or do you see it as this precisely this sort of utopian experiment? Uh, and then to what extent... <laughs> Is it a viable experiment? Well, every, everything positive that we attempt to do in our lives, you know, as leftists, as people who have a systematic and systemic approach to changing the world, has to be considered a utopian, you know, experiment. You would never say something was a, like a, a cynical experiment, sure. <clears throat> but does this relate to anarchism? I wanted to run through the very, very real things that I saw first. And the other major, major thing is in, in the liberation of women is that there must be for any position, one man and one woman for those positions. That's co-chairmanship or co-chairpersonship <laughs> or co-chairs is the term, sorry. And so the leadership of the PYD has to have one woman and one man and they are co-chairs and they share that position. Uh, a mayor of a town is, is one man, one woman. And that's, that's spread now to the HDP was the same system in Turkey, which is a related movement, though obviously not directly linked. And it's now spread to other parts of the Turkish left. So the party that I mentioned earlier, the MLKP, within this time said now that it's going to have this 
co-chair system. And that's really big. Like that's, that's something that's a change that would make a big difference in the UK. Anyway, I've run through the things which I, I could see with my eyes. Now, is this anarchism? First of all, you have an issue there, which is, is anarchism real? Um, and the answer is, is no. It's, it's a real philosophy. It's a real ideology because people believe in it in the same way that, I don't know, the Harry Potter universe is real and people believe in it. it it's, its terminology exists, but can it actually exist? Well, no. And the contradiction in Rishabh was so, so clear because people, idealistic people from the West were saying, this is democracy without the state. Yet there I was carrying a weapon, carrying an AK-47 and extra rounds to enforce the law, to check through villages looking for ISIS, looking for ISIS materials, looking for ISIS stay behind units, looking for anything that looked like a bomb. And those people who were found, and I didn't have to do this personally, but I was part of these missions, were arrested and taken somewhere. Okay, this is the same. This is a revolutionary system. It was a revolutionary experience, but it's a state. There's a there's a monopoly on the use of force. There are very clear demarcated borders. Like how much clearer could you be than a war? You know, where where did the edge of this territory? Well, you'll notice because there's a whole bunch of fortifications along the edge. So how could this not be anything except a state? What I respect about the system and the reason that they don't embrace the term state is because they've come from a very the ideology of Abdullah Oshlan. He's come from one of the worst chauvinistic oppressive states. The foundation of Turkey was based in the blood and the oppression of so many minorities to force this really kind of brutal sense that there's going to be some new people that are Turks and they're the only people that live there, despite the, the, the you know thousands of different identities that already live there. And so in reaction to this, they have this rhetoric around being against the state, because in the Middle East, you know, also look at Iraq, you know, look at look at Saddam's Iraq um, and look at other, you know, very much despotic or very patriarchal kind of systems of these big, powerful people who try and transform their countries. And and they do that by treading on different minorities, uh, generally between Sunni and Shia. I can see why they reject those things. And so they put their emphasis so much on kind of tolerance. And so much on a, on a sense of, of more like community without borders rather than yeah. national boundaries. But they, they have this rhetoric of being against the state. Yeah, but I but guess it's, that, as you're saying, it, it, seems to be, it seems to be being born under the shadow of this very hard domineering Turkish nationalism that, uh, yeah. that it breeds. It's kind of that it breeds. It's almost its polar opposite. But maybe it's, as you say, it's maybe yeah. more in rhetoric than in practice. And in fact, you know, Echelon himself his own thought has developed significantly, let's say, and, you know, the PKK itself um, moved yeah. from from a kind of much more uh, kind of Marxist-Leninist position to, to, to kind of anarchism after the fall of the Soviet Union. So, I mean, there's some interesting uh, kind it's of courses not, it's taking not, there. It's not anarchism. The, the PKK's ideology, Abdullah Oshlan, it's not anarchism. He polemicizes against anarchism. I was really lucky enough to be trained as a YPG recruit, even though I was going to the IFB. It was a really great opportunity that I got. And we got the Apo list. That's, um, they call him uh, uh, Uncle Apo. So the people that follow him are called Apo G. And we got the Apo list training. And it laid into Marxism. Um, it laid into anarchism. And it laid into anarchism, I felt, like a lot harder. He called it a pe- he, his, his criticism was the classic Marxist-Leninist criticism which was a petty bourgeois movement, which was destined, you know, to be unable to take power. He has his own sympathist ideology, which is entirely his own. I mean, you can call it democratic federalism, you can call it apoism. I prefer to call it apoism because I, I, I associate it so much with him and his character, his style. And it's, it's a mixture of philosophy and politics. And I don't mean like Marx, I mean like philosophy and politics. He's got alternative ways of viewing history, which are not you know, linear, he says there's a different society, that there's two, two streams. One is the stream of civilization and one is the stream of something like the people. And these are like really philosophical concepts. And I think they're very beautiful. And I was very proud to fight alongside them whilst never being uh, a demo, well, never identifying as apoist. I would always identify as a Marxist Leninist. And I think that's really important to note that that is the ideology of the YPG, of the Apogee. That's what they follow. That's their kind of philosophical um, inspiration. And it's not very, very um, exact. You know, it's, it's much more of a culture which is built up through their 40 years of war uh, in the PKK, which has now spread. That ideology has now spread to Syria with the YPG. Though there's obviously no connection between the two. 
And um, that's, that's their philosophy. It's not anarchism. You cannot find Murray Bookchin in Rashava. You cannot find Murray Bookchin in Turkish or Kurdish, to my knowledge. And you cannot find any mention of Murray Bookchin in anything, even in the education session that we, we had. They talked about how Apo had come into, into contact with new ideas when he was in prison. But we talked about Nietzsche more than we talked about Murray Bookchin. In fact, I don't wow. remember really discussing Murray Bookchin, apart from when Westerners who were being trained would bring it up and say, what about Murray Bookchin? <laughs> oh seriously seriously and then and then let's 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 have a look at murray bookchin i mean let's do that as well so murray bookchin spends most of his life as an anarchist no, then in the so, 90s, so we, we we don't need to we don't need to talk about murray <laughs> we've talked well, we've these, talked about murray before <laughs> So, I mean, it's I mean, it's great stuff. And um, and I appreciate, you know, and I take and appreciate your point about um, the not only kind of Ocalan's thought um, developed, but also Murray Bookchin's thought as well. And like you say, he renounced anarchism for something else. And, you know, it's an important point to make and not and also not least your criticisms of its um, kind of small scale and parochial vision. Um, mm. I'm glad I'm glad you've emphasized the um, the. The kind of the hard military and political facts of needing to of what was you know what's required to organize um, life um, in northern Syria in the midst of all this turmoil and conflict, and I wanted to talk about um, what the geopolitics of that are because obviously as current you know as current now with the Turkish um, with the Turkish intervention into Syria yeah. one of the big controversies on the left is how wise the Kurds were to rely on American air power and political support. And so on the yeah. one hand, there are those who cast it you know, as kind of this Faustian bargain that has ultimately ended up undermining the position of the Kurds. And on the other hand, there are those who take a more kind of realist line and say that the Kurds basically had no choice. It was a matter of survival and that they... Um, you know that they had uh, that they made um, their reliance on American air power was something that couldn't be avoided. I wondered how you what you make of that debate and where which um, where you would fall in it. It was a massive identity crisis for me because when I was first inspired to start getting involved, um, American involvement was was very low or had just started or hadn't. I mean, when I first obviously heard about the Russia Revolution, the Americans weren't involved. And the way that the siege of Kobani was explained to me was tied in with how the Americans got involved. And the YPG and its supporters, the leftists that I was with, were like the resistance in Kobani um, against the siege of ISIS, who up, up until that point had never been stopped. ISIS was seen as an almost mythically um, unbeatable force. And that's often why towns would fall to them, because people were just like, run. <laughs> and, um, and the resistance that the Kurds put up in Kobani basically shamed um, the international community, America, into taking a side, because America was basically ready to accept that ISIS was, a, was just simply a matter of fact, and that was who was going to be controlling a certain part of uh, Syria, which if you look at American involvement in Syria, they're absolutely fine. They're quite happy to work with groups that are basically as bad as ISIS, uh, politically and ideologically. So the Kurds saw it as a victory that they just kind of shamed America into giving them support. Um, in terms of, was it a Faustian pact? I mean, so what do the Americans get out of this so-called pact? At best, the Americans get the chance to say to, you know, their voters, their people, oh, you know, we're fighting ISIS. That's what they get. And that's, they get the ability to go on TV and say, and refer to them as our greatest allies. The Kurds are our greatest allies, which I think is complete nonsense. They're not allies. The Americans are allied to the Kurds, but the Kurds are not American allies. They're not carrying out American intentions. The YPG was fighting for its own agenda and it was fighting ISIS for its own agenda. And so whilst it was fighting ISIS, it would get American support. So therefore, fighting in Manbij, which is not typically part of the Rashava territory, and then fighting in Raqqa, which is certainly not part of the Rashava territory, because you knew you'd get American air support and basically nothing else. The Americans were not fighting shoulder to shoulder with, with me or anyone else. I was never, you know, billeted with Americans. I saw like one American Humvee the whole time I was there, it was it's not like it's not like you're, you're mixed troops, the Americans at all. The fact that we're going for Raqqa and Mambij because they get this American support and then they get to take that territory. And then in a much stronger bargaining position at the end of the war. And that was their thinking. And that is the case now. 
the territory which they're retreating from has tripled in the size that it would have been if they hadn't done that. So they've got places to retreat to. They've got places where they've been able to spread their revolution and spread their ideas um, that they can now fall back to. Without the American involvement, that wouldn't have been an option. So I suppose one thing that strikes me, though, is, um, you know, and I take I take what you're saying about the um, about uh, the character of the of that alliance and so on. Um, but I suppose the way in which it's been cast here is as if, um, you know, on the one hand, everyone, this kind of um, uh, this proverb, the kind of Kurdish proverb, the only friends of the Kurds of the mountains has been kind of widely publicized since the Turkish invasion. And it's been turned into a kind of parable of um, of Western perfidy and that yeah. the Kurds have been betrayed again. But I wonder, I mean, and I don't know how much, I mean, you know, I don't know how much you're con- you still have connections with what's going on there. But it struck me, I mean, surely um, there must have been um, some uh, political expectation on the part of the Kurds that something like this would happen. Pre- I mean, precisely, you know, if they live with that kind of proverb, they must have surely known that something like this was due to happen at some point. Absolutely. In the process of dealing with, as I say, this identity crisis that I had, because, you know, as I said in my political journey, anti-imperialism was what turned me from being a sort of radical, liberal type, wishy-washy, to being uh, a Marxist feminist, anti-imperialism, and that absolute condemnation of, of the West having any kind of role in the Middle East or anywhere else, in fact, um, outside of their own borders. Um, so I had this big crisis and I went to speak to a YPG commander I did an interview for a leftist website um, where I asked him, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the story of the Americans? You know, do you support the American role here? And they're like, no, absolutely not. It's a military alliance and it's going to last as long as it lasts, but not very long. We don't expect it to last very long. And they said, we know from the way that we see the world, we know the way from our ideology, one day us and the Americans are going to be enemies again. And I was just like, right, cool. OK, <laughs> I can deal with it on that basis then. And that's what I was told. Now, you do see some very, very strange stuff on Twitter coming from the leadership. When I was looking at Twitter today and the leader of the SDF, Maslam Kobani, was saying, thank you so much, Trump, for everything you're doing, despite the fact that Trump is doing absolutely nothing. And I would see that as politics. You know, that's that's politicking. Um, It would be great if there was more ideological resolve throughout the whole of the YPG and the SDF. It's not, you know, it's not a huge problem for me. At the moment, they're playing everyone in that region against, um, in, you know, in, in their own defence against their worst enemy, who is Turkey, and has always been Turkey, and will always be Turkey. And that's what they're doing. So if we turn to the Turkish invasion, um, and based on your, um, you know, the military kind of training you had and your own experience of um, setting up communes on the ground and trying to kind of piece together um kind of ethnic alliances and new political structures and also your kind of um military experience um how do you think the pyd the ypj will be responding to the kurdi to the sorry to the turkish invasion now i think they're not gonna they're not gonna risk you know ridiculous losses they're not gonna they're, they're very tactical and very intelligent army um and they're not gonna do anything which just sacrifices you know thousands of lives to save particular places but they will come back um, and they will make every every step that the turkish army and its aligned jihadi groups um they'll make them pay as much as they possibly can using all sorts of different tactics um and those those groups are not going to hold those places they don't have the kind of roots that the kurdish revolution the Rusyan revolution has they don't have the roots Oh, the progressive uh, politics, they don't have the experiences of those people who've been living under that system have. And those groups are going to, you know, they're not going to be able to last it, in, in my opinion. The only thing that might happen is that this, um, this occupation becomes much more fortified by Syria itself. If Syria steps in to actually cooperate far more with Turkey rather than seeing them as something as an, of an enemy, that it's, you know, it's a mixed bag. Every day I have another nightmare as I see Erdogan shaking hands with a new world leader and have another kind of crisis. Um, you know, the only, the only thing that I see that they could really, really keep the YPG and the Rashad revolution out of, its, um, out of its, its main territory would be some kind of deal where Turkey and Syria and therefore with its Russian backing actually manages those things. But even then, you know, five years, 10 years, they won't hold it. 
this region has become revolutionised, and um, and it will it will overcome that. And I'm absolutely certain of it. And the only so that major goes, thing that goes right to the next question I was going to ask, which is: so, how robust do you think the political structures and practices that have been established um, in the region in this time? How how resilient do you think they'll be, and how will they last? Particularly if um, if uh, Merdian succeeds in the kind of ethnic cleansing project that seems to have been mooted um, for this strip of territory that Turkey wants to hold. Yeah, I think the ethnic cleansing thing has definitely started doing that in Afrin. Um, but I think with this region, I think there would be a new offence, a new outrage, and I think it would lead to more of an uprising, uh, maybe in Turkey, maybe you know, actually in Rashava, even fiercer fighting. Um, or maybe more of an outrage across the world. Um, I think it would be kind of an even greater offence than a military invasion, um, the, the literally replacing the Kurds with, um, with refugees. I mean, the world is kind of watching that one. Um, in terms of how robust the structures are, well, obviously, if the people who <laughs> have learned those structures are moved, then they, they go with those people. So they'll go to the next territory, they'll go to whatever it is, whether it's, you know, ad hoc, uh, accommodation like some kind of camps or if it's they move to other cities like the system that they've been taught and it's a very kind of powerful holistic um way of seeing the world the the one that you know i only had a couple of weeks training it of course people train in it for, for months um for years uh i think you know it will stay with the people will it stay exactly in the region that's uh that the is taken over by the military invade military invasion i mean probably not because they'll be flooding in lots of other stuff as well, but obviously different people. So if you move the people, obviously the ideology goes as well. What would, um, what would you say, Alexander, what are the most important political, what's the, I suppose, what's the greatest legacy then of um, the Rojava revolution? I think I, I can only really talk about it from, from my own perspective, because I consider myself a revolutionary, I identify as a revolutionary in, in a time which is not really a revolution to where I live in the UK. Uh, it's a time of an upsurge of the left. Uh, but that kind of revolutionary mentality is certainly lacking um, that kind of dedication. And when people try and sort of work out the political system, such as you know, desperately studying democratic confederalism, trying to work out how they managed to have this revolution in, in such an isolated place under such terrible conditions, they're ignoring the, the things that they don't want to see, which is, as I said, military discipline, uh, as a cu culture of total sacrifice and selflessness, a culture of of total respect and comradeship. It's not a magic bullet that you're going to find this magic ideology. Um, and it's exactly the same kind of things that they did with Zapatistas, because they love the Zapatistas, because they seem to you know, avoid any actual fighting. You're not going to find that. You're going to find a war which really started 40 years ago in uh, Turkish Kurdistan, is now, fight, is now also fighting in, in, um, in the Kurdish region of Syria. And that requires discipline, organization, and structure. And a commitment to it, and a commitment to, to selflessness, uh, comradeship, and respect. All right, excellent stuff, Alexander. That's uh, been great to talk to you and to hear both from about your experiences and also about your understanding of uh, of the Kurdish struggle and of the kind of uh, political ideologies at play in that region. So, thanks so much for joining us. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. All right, fascinating to hear from both those volunteers to hear from Danny and from Alexander about their respective motivations, uh, as well as their views of the struggle in northern Syria, both in a military and a political sense. It's remarkable, Phil. I, you know, I, I think you have to reach for like the, the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War to try to find a sort of correlate. And the struggle there that people were going off to join in many ways represented the interwar period and the coming struggle between, well, communism and fascism. I guess maybe being a little bit provocative, but do you think Rajava represents our age in some way? It's a really good question. I mean, I think the differences, I suppose, are as striking as the similarities. Um, so, I mean, it's obviously it was on a much smaller scale in terms of the international volunteers um, who went to Rojava compared to the international brigades in Spain. Um, and I suppose also a very different kind of civil war. So it's, uh, whereas um, Syria is uh, a country that's been kind of um, caught up in the Arab Spring, 
the battle in Spain in the 1930s was the precursor to a world war between the leading powers of the age, and um, that would eventually, um, you know, lead to um, a kind of conflagration on a much greater scale. So I think the comparisons are as interesting as though the differences are some as interesting as the similarities, and I think. I think there is something to the idea that the same way that the international character of the Spanish Civil War told you something about the character of conflict in that era, I think you could probably also make this case for Rojava as well. Um, and I suppose what I might hazard is that what's striking about the what what's one of the kind of telling features about it, and there are, there are quite a few, in fact. But what's one of the telling features, maybe, is that the the Rojava revolution was has been very explicitly um, cast itself as against the idea of the state. Um, so, at least politically, the way in which, and I know this was um, contested to a certain degree by um, Alexander Norton when we chatted with him about the kind of the reality on the ground of the military struggle. Um, the need for force against jihadists and so on. But I wonder if there is, I mean, you know, explicitly um, the PYD, the YPJ have uh, said they're not seeking out Kurdish independence, only Kurdish autonomy within Syria. But also there's been, um, and I was, I mean, I was also on a, in as part, taking part in a debate on the weekend with a representative, a Kurdish representative of the Syrian Kurds in London. And she also reiterated this point that the, um, that the Kurds are not seeking, they're seeking to maintain a different kind of political model, which is decentralized, participatory, um, horizontalist, as opposed to the, um, as opposed to the kind of centralized, um, hierarchical, patriarchal, authoritarian state that emerged out of the post-colonial era. So, anyway. which, which further marks a contrast to the Stalinism in, uh, you know, in Catalonia at the time, for example. <laughs> um, you, well, that contrast, but I was going to say also, I think it's perhaps telling, it was a long, I mean, it was a long way of getting around to the point of saying that perhaps the Kurds' refusal or careiness about establishing um, a state or unwillingness to call what they're doing some kind of state building process and their um, caution over establishing their sovereignty um, and national independence, maybe that speaks to something about our age with its general um, suspicion of state sovereignty, its general suspicion of um, centralized political authority. Um, and this is something we've spoken about also with um, in the most recent book club as well, um, with um, Eliane Glazer's book. So I think maybe that's one of the one of the telling aspects of the Rojava revolution. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, on the other hand, there is a certain strategic justification for it. I mean, the PKK in Turkey has always uh, traditionally sought autonomy within Turkey and has not sought to to break away from the Turkish state, uh, and it's probably done that because of uh, be, precisely for, for you know trying to set more limited strategic aims and not uh, well maybe trying to limit the the extent to which uh, to the Turkish state would try would crush the Kurds. I don't know. I don't. I mean, I'm not entirely. No, uh, sure. I mean, I'm sure. You know, I mean, I'm sure there is an element of um, political realism in the calculation and the cognizance of the overall geopolitical situation and the unlikelihood of being able to carve out a Turkish and independent Turkish state. Sorry, Kurdish state. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, I, I still want. You know, the. It's not just. Um, it seems to me like a virtue is being made of necessity. So, in the sense that there was particularly from. Um, the woman that I was participating in the debate with on over the weekend, that um, there's an expressly ideological rejection of the idea of state sovereignty as such. And that seems to me to also speak to a general suspicion on the left as well of um, centralized forms of political authority and still the kind of um, still the the glorification of horizontalism, participatory kind of devolved participatory structures this kind of stuff yeah i mean you know yes on the other hand i think there's an element of um of resistance to and you know i asked put it this way i i mean i even asked danny about this about the degree to which the people who are there fighting are kurdish nationalists 
or the extent to which they are genuine believers in either socialism or uh, democratic confederalism or what have you. Uh, you know, what is their ideological motivation there? Uh, and I guess the resistance to centralized power and to the state in some ways is also a resistance to nationalism, which has its positive side uh, in the, in that context because of its ability to retain, uh, you know, inter-ethnic uh, cooperation within, within, a, within a single political community, which they're trying to set up, which, uh, you know, which is important in, in, in today's Middle East, to, to, put, to put it lightly, um, in a context in which you have a, a significant increase in sectarianism across the region. And even the, the, the failed models of the Arab republics, at least, although premised on a, on a sort of a single uh, ethnic identity, were secular states, which at least allowed the possibility of, um, you know, of kind of a, of a sort of multi-ethnic um, some degree of multi-ethnic harmony uh, rather than having a, you know, kind of completely uniform or a drive for a uniform national state, which, you know, to take the example of Turkey, yeah, sure. you know, Turkey would be probably one of the examples of the hardest kind of nationalisms that was, was created around in the early 20th century. So the, the resistance against centralized power might also be a reflection of the resistance uh, to any sort of uh, ethnic nationalism. No, sure. I mean, I think, you know, there, I don't wish to take away from the achievements of the um, of um, the Kurdish effort to try and kind of sustain a modus vivendi among the various groups in that part of the world. But by the same token, I mean, it's not to it wouldn't be to uh, to suggest that um, nationalism by its very nature well it's not to say i suppose that nation the you would only have the model of kind of exclusivist nationalism or a viciously kind of um chauvinistic nationalism um i suppose i mean i obviously i mean i you know i'm not gonna obviously i'm not making the case for nationalism one way or the other it's only to say that the i think um that the suspicion the seeming suspicion of centralized political authority i think is problematic on the left as a whole and the fact that the Kurds seem to have um, cast their project in those terms seems to be in keeping with the tenor of the times. Right. And that brings us to the question of what the appeal is for you know, Westerners uh, or those outside of, of the region uh, who have gone off to, to fight there or to contribute to the struggle. Because it, there's several things which point in different ways. I mean, if you listen to testimonies, not just to the ones that uh, you know listeners will have heard now with, the, uh, with with Danny and Alexander that we spoke to, but also any other sort of testimonies that you have people who are very who emphasize, um, let's say, more postmodern sort of aspects uh, with regard to sort of intersectionalism, um, whereas others will emphasize a much more traditional um, sort of. Uh, national liberation struggle right and i and that also i guess makes us reflect on what is actually going on there because and what is the proper way to see rojava is it merely just a national liberation struggle from the part of an oppressed people is it uh, a national liberation struggle but which is much more um, progressive in terms of its content than many other past national liberation struggles have been. Uh, is it a new form of society? Uh, is the emphasis on feminism, for example, uh, a real key takeaway? Is it, or is it something which is to be understood in a way in which it's subsumed under um, under the formation of a new nation, but on more progressive grounds? Well, I think it clearly can't be national liberation. I mean, for the reasons, you know, I mean, it clearly, or it's a postmodern diluted version of classical national liberation for the reasons that we've mentioned. Um, I th certainly think the um, emphasis on women's participation and equal participation and so on, that definitely appeals and clearly is, again, keeping in tenor with the Western left about that it's... Um, uh, kind of a regimented, not in terms of representing interests, but rep identity itself has to be directly represented. So equal participation of women um, at all levels and so on. And yeah, I mean, perhaps, perhaps but, it, but, it's, that's, but it's a great thing. And actually, it's, I would say it's more radical. I mean, it, well, it's more radical than you, could, you have I mean, in you a lot of Western case... fourth wave feminism because it's, you know, one, it's not women as victims. It's not women as girl bosses. You know, it's a collective struggle on the basis of gender equality. Yeah, I mean, can't disagree with that. Sure. But to talk about why it appeals, the other thing as well, there is the eco, um, 
the way in which they've made very clear trying to establish a um, ecological, a new kind of ecological model. And that does, again, I mean, that seems to me, again, kind of making a virtue of necessity in the sense that it doesn't, you know, I mean, it's clearly kind of um, painting a gloss, I think, on a particular, you know, in a project of a, a region that's in the midst of such a bloody war and is um, poor and underdeveloped to begin with. Um, whatever, you know, ecological claims can be made for it don't seem to me to be um, of any kind of political significance. And so that seems to me more ideological. But again, all of it's got to be kind of maintain, you know, put in the put in the idea of um, Apoism. Apo being Kurdish for uncle and the uncle in this case being Abdullah Ocalan, who's still imprisoned in Turkey as the leader of the PKK. So, um, you know, it's kind of contained within a whole theory, I mean, of uncleism, effectively. Um, and so the idea that it's um, cast off all the uh, inherited patriarchal ideals of the past or, um, uh, you know, has no, has kind of cast off the cult of personality associated with, um, associated with Ocalan, you know, that seems to me not to be the case. Right. So to round this out, we should probably talk about the geopolitical aspects uh, firstly, something which I think is kind of running through uh, our interviews with both of the both of the people we spoke to, which is the question of U.S. alignment. Let's you know, and I put that in quotation marks. Uh, I mean, were the Kurds right? I think you know Alexander Norton certainly was very forthright about the fact that you know they were not U.S. allies. It's merely the fact that the U.S. allowed the Kurds to operate there. Um, to allow the People's Protection Units, the Syrian Defense Forces, to operate in that area and then have, you know, committed treason against them by inviting the Turks in and then allowing the Turks in. It's a hard one. I mean, I don't, um, I think the, to, to, I mean, clearly everyone thinks that the U.S. has betrayed the Kurds. And so if they betrayed the Kurds, then that means they were allies to a degree. Um, I think the, it's an uh, impossibly difficult question in terms of the hard, you know, if we're talking kind of hard political realities, then it seems to me that um, given that the Kurds aren't going for an independent state, they need some degree of regional, territorial, provincial autonomy in a federal or confederal Syria in as part of a wider peace settlement in the region in the Syrian civil war. And the really hard question there is a deal with Damascus and the regime in Damascus and also a deal with the Russians the patrons of the regime in Damascus. So I think if there is a hard political question for the Kurds, I think that's the much more central one um, than, um, than the question of uh, a deal with Washington. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, I mean, I think the, you know, the Americans, the kind of previous American air protectorates have never worked out well. If we think of what happened in Kosovo 20 years ago, um, the bombing of Yugoslavia that led to the establishment of a United Nations protectorate in Kosovo. Kosovo is in nominally independent now, but it's still a de facto protectorate with NATO forces on its territory run by commissioners from the European Union. And then the neighboring Kurdistan in Iraq, which was also kind of made into an air protectorate with American air power after the first Gulf War. That too effectively became a... Um, a base for the American incursion into Iraq and was also the basis for American involvement in Iraq leading to the Iraq war, um, that the Americans eventually managing that air protectorate of Kurdistan eventually led to their further escalation and being dragged further and deeper and deeper into the quagmire of um, their conflict with uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. So I don't think you would wish, you know, I think you wouldn't, you wouldn't wish an air protectorate on anyone an American air protectorate on anyone because the pattern, you know, the historical pattern isn't a good one. And we, the last thing you'd want to do is to make the Kurds into um, the repository of a new white man's burden um, in which we have to defend the Kurds in order to be, um, you know, ethically, in order to be um, ethically superior and that they need to be the repositories for our bad consciences. I think that would be a terrible fate to inflict on them. Well, I mean, you know, with that in mind, I guess we have to hope and wish and, and uh, you know, send our strength to uh, the Kurdish struggle there that they're able to fight off the invading Turkish army to the greatest extent possible. Um, because, I mean, what's going on now is 
as I said at the introduction, uh, basically ethnic cleansing. Uh, they're you know introducing Turkish la- uh, language in Afrin after the assault uh, on that uh, on that city, and uh, you know and, and that the, the the Turkish the Turkish state is probably the most malevolent actor in this piece right now. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what exactly emerges because you made reference to the Russians. Uh, Russia has, you know, sustains the, the Syrian regime. It's also allied with Turkey and Turkey is allied with the jihadis, uh, who, <laughs> who are enemies of this, the Syrian regime. So how that exactly play out, plays out is unclear, but, uh, I hope we've been able to at least shed some light on this and, uh, and, uh, please do check out the uh, links that we've, we've included below and all the best to uh, the Kurdish struggle there.